Um, welcome to Tech for Good Bye. Bye. Ooh. Ooh, happy Ooh. Birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, us. Bye. Um, yeah, do tweet about us and stuff. It's helpful. Thank you. Uh, so, what's going to happen today? We've got a doctor, Dr. Paul Joyce, um, <laughs> talking about can we measure the true impact of CSR? And we struggled with a second speaker. We, we didn't get one, basically. <laughs> Sorry. This event came around really quickly, didn't it? <laughs> And the last one was so big and exhausting, so yeah, that didn't happen. Um, but we thought we'd do something fun, if you don't mind. Uh, we want to do a quick innovation task with you. Um, does, I think everybody has a lot of thoughts on corporate social responsibility, um, and it, we'd like to get those thoughts off you, if that's all right. So we want to like, crowdsource some ideas of how CSR can be made better uh, through digital. Uh, from the Tech for Good Manchester community. That sounds good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you up yeah. for it? Cool, yay! Uh, as usual, oh, then we've got lightning talks. I do have some people who are interested in giving some upfront, so hopefully they're here. Otherwise, I'm just going to shout names. No, not here. Okay, okay. Um, Reason Digital, thank you very much for sponsoring. Woo! Uh, tech Soup and 34SB, thank you for the pizza, 34SB, and the beer. Woo! You're our favourite sponsor. And uh, that's it, that's all I have to say. So I'm going to go hand this straight over to Paul Joyce, Dr. Paul Joyce. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Happy. Oh, thank you. Does it? It does. Oh, hello, everyone. Hello, Paul. Hello. Right, um, so I've uh, been invited here because I work at Reason Digital. No, I don't. Uh, we do sometimes. <laughs> oh, shut up, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we do a project on CSR, so it's quite a difficult concept. So, as people understand the nature of CSR, anybody heard that before as an acronym? Yes. Although Bex has already said it's corporate social responsibility. Now that can mean a lot of things, but it essentially means people, businesses, organisations doing good things. Uh, actually, that's a good example there. So there's Barclays, in partnership with Barclays. This is part of Barclays' CSR project. <coughs> So what is CSR and why is it important? Here's a nice densely piped, long-winded, lots of words on the slide. You're not supposed to do this, by the way. <clears throat> but essentially, it's, uh, if you look right at the end, the triple bottom line, so it's economic, social, environmental performance. There are a million definitions of CSR in the world. This is just one of them. Uh, it's not a bad one. Um, the triple bottom line is quite interesting in that it kind of, um, kind of reflects on some kind of uh, maybe accounting practice. The accounting practice would be a, a, the bottom line. This is the triple bottom line. So it kind of speaks to that. So it, it kind of suggests that you can do something and measure and measure in a way that you would do if you were doing sage or zero or any other kind of accounting package but it's not as simple as that unfortunately but i'll boil down this into something very simple csr is about doing good and not doing bad i think that's about it really uh, and i think as a definition it's not it's not too bad actually <clears throat> no there's a kind of philosophical debate about how business interacts with the kind of social world. And this is a kind of schema where you have kind of extremes from top to bottom, where you would have, um, this is Albert Carr, not Alan Carr, he's completely different. Uh, so it's pure profit making. So in this kind of world, um, perhaps people have recognized the name Milton Friedman, kind of free market, popularist, we live in his world, basically, because this is Thatcherism, Reaganomics. But this is a slightly more extreme version, well, not extreme, kind of refined version. But essentially, they would say that 
business has no responsibility to society. As, in fact, if you remember, Mrs. Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as society. And this reflects this, in that all that business should do is do business. But as you see down here, you see that at the bottom, there's a view, philosophical view, that businesses should be part of the kind of social matrix almost. And because of that, businesses should do good. They should do social good. So CSR kind of lives in this world, these kind of extremes. So CSR actually would be more kind of this bit, these two. Whereas these would see CSR as um, a kind of economic burden that's dragging the business down. But you can see from maybe the 50s, 60s, there's been a steady drift from these positions to these positions. So what I'm going to describe basically in terms of CSR is these two. But uh, again, I've simplified this. The two extremes, the responsibility of business is to do good business, and that's it. The responsibility of business is doing social good. So you, you see that in many other businesses that who, who would you put in this one? Uh, Sports Direct, maybe? <laughs> I think they're not as ethical as perhaps they should be. Who would be in this bit? I don't know. Um, some kind of smoothie producer? <laughs> I don't know. In fact, can anybody suggest somebody who would be Tom's. exemplar? Who? Tom's. Oh, yeah, Tom's, the shoe people. Yeah. So they do, they have various pair of shoes you buy, they will donate to pair of shoes? That's the one. That's the one. That seems quite a responsible thing to do. People have feet. <laughs> Still? No, this is in that kind of the next stage of this, which is <clears throat> uh, a kind of, what would you say? Whereas that previous one was more static about how business would situate themselves in a kind of put the pro forma the, in the table previously. This is more about how businesses might evolve. So you can see this one will be what's it, BP. So they they accidentally spill billions of barrels of oil in the Mexican Gulf, and they have to deny, defend, deflect. In fact, I saw it on the bus today. There's a there's a, a film, Deepwater Horizon. Probably rubbish. Got Mark Wahlberg in it. Although he's oh sorry, he's probably very good. <laughs> he's probably very good. Uh, so it's in this scheme, it's like a movement towards something. So you can see the evolution of business from they start off defending denying things, deflecting blame. So it's, a, it's around, um, what would you call it, reputational damage. And then you get to these bits where you see compliance, where it's, we do stuff, uh, we have to do stuff because it's a legal requirement. So we do stuff and we, we just kind of tick box it. So it's part of a cost. So it's, there's a cost of all, uh, uh, kind of associated with doing that kind of business, and that's it. You know, there's no real buy-in here. Whereas in this one, it becomes part of the managerial ethos almost. So you, instead of just tick boxing, it's actually how management sees themselves managing the business. And as it steadily goes down into the kind of strategic, the kind of CSR social good element can becomes more integrated in how the business does business to the point where it's central to how the business sees itself, so it's part of its identity, <coughs> which is fine and dandy. Now, what usually happens uh, when people invest, well, let's say Barclays again. Barclays do um, uh, employment training for NEAT, which are not in education, employment, or training, neat. So it's like uh, 16 to 18, maybe older. 
So imagine that they they do a uh, a program where they have a, a series of skills or needs in order to get back into work. So the inputs would be needs. The activity would be the program that Barclays perhaps does. The outputs would be how many people have gone through the program. Now this, this bit gets interesting because outcomes, which are slightly different from our well, we returns at this point. Outputs and outcomes. So outcomes might be actually those kids actually get a job, which is slightly more. So in terms of a process, that's quite simple. And then you get something more complex. This little arrow indicates that you've um, some kind of added value, that you've imposed some kind of um, extra kind of calculation almost into turning outputs into, into outcomes. And ultimately what you want is social impact. Social impact would be oh, stable communities, less crime, uh, more social mobility, more engagement in society for those needs. Because oh, potentially those needs would be, well, this, this is kind of stereotyping, but troublemakers. And then you ultimately lean to good citizens. Now at each point, you can see that there's kind of calculations to be made. If you're doing, if you're running this activity, you can count how many people in, how many people complete, complete do some research about how many of the people who complete actually get jobs, do some extra research about how the people who in work actually uh, become good citizens, do less crime. Sorry, can I disagree with you? Yes, <coughs> please. Yeah, your number of jobs would still go in output. Your outcomes would be increases in self-esteem. Oh, you could do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Will, I think this is quite flexible in, in terms of what you would see as an outcome. I think uh, self-esteem is a great one, yeah. But sometimes when you go to people and you talk to them and you say, um, you know, they're, they're quite happy with the input output thing, and then you try and persuade them about self-esteem, and then they say, yeah, it's, um, yeah. But when you give something, some tangible results around yeah, but the real jobs. Output, outcomes are touchy Yes, I will, I will live with that. Yes, these are more touchy feeling, which I will, I'll come back to later. I was trying to make them slightly more concrete. Touchy feeling, touchy feeling. <coughs> so that's sorted there. No. <coughs> uh, the EU did a really big project over the last oh, 10 years. Uh, it finished in 2014. Basically, what they wanted to do was almost do the accounting thing, where you could plug in some data at the beginning and have those social impacts at the end. Uh, and all the resources of the EU were kind of directed towards it. Well, some of them, not all of them, obviously. You, you had French farmers to pay. Uh, so they did that. It was a big, high-profile process. What they got out to the end was <clears throat> lack of knowledge on pathways to outcomes, uh, no common agreement on how you measure things, high costs, uh, companies don't see the need for it, companies don't actually take responsibility. Now this, this is kind of high profile, high level, but some of the things that we found as part of the research process actually reflect this. They, there's a kind of disconnect between the kind of fundamental philosophical understanding of CSR and the actual on the ground measurement of it. <clears throat> That's a good picture of somebody being looking slightly confused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, what we did, what we had to do, um, there we go, back a bit. Part of the things uh, that I can mention reason, can't I? Yeah, I'm going to mention reason. <laughs> reason uh, had to have to do a paid, so it's okay. Uh, the BBC's 
uh, CSR report or help to PDF it or something. <laughs> propagate, propagate. And what basically what happened is that in order to do that, you had to collect all the information up from various agencies within the BBC. BBC has not got a good reputation for internal efficiency, but even so. Um, so they had to collect all the information together and produce something interesting. So the people that they were talking to at the BBC, they would say, we need this information, and they would just go, uh, we haven't got the information, we need to ring around, search emails, you know, find bits and bobs. And it was a real problem. The information was there, but it was like spread across a really diverse organization. And nobody had real kind of ownership of, of that information. So the, um, the founders of Reason decided to create something that would, a kind of digital solution to kind of fill this gap. Very funny. <coughs> so the need. So to bring all the activities together in one place, which is always good, and no last minute scramble for data. So essentially it's quite a relatively simple thing, but you have to bear in mind what we were saying before about measurement and moving from outputs to outcomes and impact. There's a whole extra dimension to this. But interestingly, we did it as an internal project so there's, there's quite kind of fundamental questions about who was the customer if it was an internal, internal project. And what does the market look like? Bearing in mind the kind of EU understanding that it's a very kind of, um, what would you say, the, the market is very, something dead. <laughs> But it, it, it's not a very simple market, it's a very complex market. So we, what we did, needed to do is kind of research the problem. So I'm, I'm a researcher, Ian over there is also a researcher. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> <coughs> so what we did, we did uh, field research, we did document analysis, we went through lots of CSS, CSR documents that I would guess that nobody has ever read. We probably read more CSR documents than anybody in the world. Uh, so we actually went out to people whose responsibility was in various organisations to do CSR. So as diverse as quite big energy suppliers down to orchestras. And there was a kind of, well I'll go on to what we found, but, and then we, we anal analysed all the documents that we had kind of boiled them down and tried to understand how CSR worked and what, what kind of market it was living in. <clears throat> so interestingly, in the kind of tech world, that we became the customers or the clients. So we would kind of drive in the process in some ways. So because there was no external client to, to bounce ideas off, it was our understanding of how the market worked and how CSR worked in that context. That's the thing that drove how we developed the product. The three things that we kind of came up with, which, you know, it's not rocket science, is collection again. But the people we talked to really didn't collect data very well. They had the data, they did things. It was out there, but like the BBC, it wasn't in one place, it was like shoe boxes full of information. Uh, often it wasn't in electronic form, it was literally in shoe boxes. They didn't see themselves as perhaps doing CSR, kind of definitional thing. Is that uh, we went to the orchestra of uh, Halle and they saw themselves as the recipient of CSR, not as the propagators. But lots of things that they do, like outreach uh, to disadvantaged communities and going in uh, on people's homes, that was CSR, but they didn't recognize it as such. The other issue was measurement. Measurement, as we saw, uh, as you were saying, like well-being, the touchy-feely things, are very hard to quantify. 
the, the process measurement's not too bad. I mean, ins, outs, fine. Process, uh, the extra dimensions are quite tricky. And the third bit was reporting. People did report it, but they kind of reported it in a kind of haphazard way because they didn't have, they had incomplete information and by its nature, it was always out of date. So it was incomplete and out of date. So we looked at those three things and thought, what can we actually work on, the kind of digital presence, and make things better? So out of, out of step, just a quick look at measurement. Output to outcome. So basically, these are some of the examples. Maybe cycling to work. Uh, could be converted into carbon saved, could be converted into well-being, it can be converted into um, health. So there's, there's a kind of panoply of, of extra dimensions to a simple activity. And lots of things that we talk to, when we talk to people, they used different systems. When we talk to housing associations, and one of the things that they used was uh, HACT, Housing Association, CT, Housing Association, <laughs> uh, Charity Trust. <coughs> and they come up with a, a very simple system in terms of, it was a spreadsheet in which you could see activities, uh, a list of activities, and then you could measure a monetized impact they've done some really incredibly sophisticated mathematics, mathematical modeling, in order to create this. And ultimately, they were able to monetize certain activities, like yoga, or what's another one, uh, keep fit, or uh, cycling. cycling, or financial security. And it was incredibly clever. If you look at the model, uh, Daniel Fujiwara, very clever man, LSC, mathematical, economic mathematical modeling, well-being model, fine. Find it on the internet, very, very good. Nobody believes it. So you would have um, uh, an activity, I'll show you one in a minute, uh, various activities, you monetize them. For housing associations, it was a, an easy, quick win. It's very much like the old adage that Nobody ever got fired buying, buying IBM, if you're an IT specialist. IBM don't make things anymore for us. But um, essentially, for housing associations, they wouldn't be downgraded if they used the height model, which is fine. Uh, but nobody really bought into it. Nobody bought into that kind of higher level understanding of how you would turn simple activities into something more tangible tangible in terms of money. Because um, kind of the shift is probably compliance would be the simplest one, which is like tick boxing, we've done something, we've got a policy for something, so ultimately to, to monetize it. But nobody actually bought into this. This is, um, our, I'm the chair of a housing association. Uh, this is our value for money, one, of, one element of our value for money statement, which you have to do, by the way. <clears throat> one community, one goal, um, is a five-side football thing for children. Um, it's very good, it works really well. It's a kind of diversionary project where uh, in some holidays you would engage with kids and potentially they wouldn't be smashing things up. Not all kids do that, obviously. The naughty ones do. But at the same time, because they are the kind of uh, captive audience who are teaching them football skills, but they're also uh, engaging in uh, sexual health teaching, which is you know really good. So we run it through the height model. Uh, 2.6 million pounds of value generated. The actual cost of putting it on was 25,000 pounds. So when we as, as the board, when we looked at that, we went, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Um, but we didn't do anything with it because we didn't quite believe it. Because you know, we're talking 2.6 million, 2.3 million youth club. You know, these are big numbers. And 
According to the hack model, they, they're all perfect. The, not perfect, but they, they stand up. <coughs> so I'll go back to that. So there was a kind of credibility gap. So in terms of measurement, when we were looking at the research, it was a big, big project. I mean, we could have spent years doing kind of just measurement. But what we decided to do was something else. We moved away from that and was focused on collecting the data. Because ultimately, people don't collect the data. So you could have a really good model. You could really have a very sophisticated model. But if people don't collect the data to plug it in, then it just falls apart. <clears throat> so what we decided to do were in, in, the kind of, in the digital sense was make sure that people could collect the data and have a kind of, kind of frictionless almost kind of entry into the model. So we decided to have a system which devolves reporting, decentralizing, because usually there's a kind of CSO manager who pulls the rent every 12 months to, to produce the report and to get to delegate as well. So it's kind of removing this and kind of more, well, not the deep, democratize, I suppose. We democratize in the collection of data to the, actually to the people who actually do the activities. So, so for example, if it was the guy who runs the five side, he would be the one who logs the information. So he would collect it. So perhaps he would collect it in terms of um, just in terms of the process that he performs for the organisation. But it would be there. So it would be quite simple. You wouldn't have to phone him up and say how many kids have you seen. And when did you see them? He could do that quickly and easily, and they'd be just in the system. And, and he'd be there to, to do extra calculations if you wish. But also what we, we decided to do was integrate as much kind of automation as possible. So we've got Google Analytics uh, feeding into our model. Google Analytics. So if you've got, say, perhaps a set of web pages offering um, financial advice. You could see how many people have gone there. For, so perhaps the trigger is they spend more than 10 seconds or whatever you want. You could actually be part of the model. You could collect that data as well, because ultimately that might get lost. But we could bring it back into the system. And in the future, if we had reasonable um, metrics to, to call align to that, we could put some social value. Similarly, we have a Nest at work. The Nest talks to us, it's got an API. That feeds into the process, so we can see how, many, how much CO2 we've saved in you know, any particular... Sorry, excuse me, what's a Nest? Oh, it's a... Who makes Nest? Google. Google. It's a, it's a fancy thermostat. <laughs> okay. right. IoT. What? Things. Yes, an IoT. You can things. set your temperature from your farm. Yeah, if you want okay. to do something like that. Not everybody does. <coughs> but that's for, what's the other one? There's another one. Hive. Uh, Hive. 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 Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I think this is just an example of a kind of integration of, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of variation of collecting data. But what we emphasize is collect the data first and then find interesting ways to manipulate the data. We can, you know, we could have information from years ago, dump, put, dump it, put it into our system, and if there were kind of credible ways of, of um, moving it from outputs to outcomes, we could apply it retrospectively. We've also got uh, an app called Gun for Good, which I recommend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to get rid of your unwanted things mm -hmm. for charity. Uh, so we've got that integrated into our system so that for every item that's uh, donated, we can have a nominal value, or we could have an actual value, or a, a value, well, whichever value we want, really. <coughs> a proper value. So that's integrated. And something like Strava, which uh, for the cyclists amongst you, Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so you could uh, go bike to work weeks, so you could see a number of miles that have been pedaled. 
Um, potentially in the future, if examples uh, say back to work, we can do not use the car or, or public transport. Potentially you could convert that into CO2 saved as well. Uh, this is all, this is uh, just a screenshot from Gone for Good. So you can see that what we what we emphasised was not the measurement per se, but just collecting the data. We made it simple. So the, the, whole, the whole technology from what we looked at as researchers was the sophistication was there in the measurement, but if you don't cap capture the data in the first place, it never gets there. So we decided to make a really clean, simple system where individuals at any level could log activities and in the future or in the present, they can convert it into some other metrics other than just numbers of activities. The good thing is it's a really good staff engagement tool as well, which was kind of an afterthought in some ways. Because we did this in terms of collecting data. But if you've got an organisation where the staff were quite active, and lots of the places we went to, the staff were very active in doing things. <clears throat> but it never got collected. It would be a Twitter, and it would disappear into the ether, and that would be it. But what we could do is integrate kind of the staff engagement into the system, maybe even gamify it. We gamify your work. Uh, for Josh's benefit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's winning. Um, so we could do that. So it's, it's a kind of a, an interesting byproduct of our kind of mentality that we, we've actually created a staff engagement tool as well, which is quite interesting in terms of unforeseen circumstances. When you create one product, you actually create a kind of artifact on top of that product. So you've got staff engagement, and it's a great comms thing. So by the nature that people log things, they take pictures of things, so they've been to, like again, for example, the, the guy who does five a side, you could take pictures of you know, kids playing five a side, tweak them out, align them to the organization. So you've got a great comms feed as well. So over and above having a CSR engagement project, We've got a staff engagement and comms project as well, which is great. Oh. Oh, so, recap. So, in terms of our journey, we looked at the, the market. The market was quite complex. The measurement skills involved in creating something were, were very complex as well. So, what we decided to do was do the thing which was the most efficient in all those circumstances, which is capturing the data in the first place. We can, the system can convert, we're quite agnostic, we've not aligned it to any particular type of metrics or system of metrics, but they can be put in the back end later. We've made it so we can easily report social investment, which is great, to kind of really interesting thing is we might be able to get rid of yearly reports. Yearly reports are always out of date the moment they're, they're produced because it takes months to do them. The data is already out of date. We can have dashboards that show live feeds and live conversions into CO2, into staff well-being, into touchy-feely things. And we can ge generate a world of social media to, sh to show the good things that somebody like Barclays do. So that's where we came to. So what happened was that we came to a very complex market, we boiled it down to something quite simple, and we've, a we've been able to create something which has so much value added that it actually is not quite the thing that we started off with. So it became capture and convert, but it, it's become social media content generator as well. And we call it Impact, because it's a good name. Uh, and it does exist. <laughs> it really does exist. Uh, and these are some of the things we do. Um, that's, that's it, yeah.
Uh, and we use it, and we're kind of rolling it out in various organizations. And this is the process, how we got there, from an internally generated project to something which works and is very good. Thanks for listening. Questions? Have any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, you mentioned your football um, project. Yes. Uh, you didn't believe the 2.6 million of value. Yes. But you said that you know it did good. Yes. How do you know? Oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you could also have those. Um, whenever you do a project, you do some kind of assessment of how it's gone. So you would have those issues around did the kids like it? Uh, did they find it fun? So you've got those metrics that you could use. The metrics that generate 2.5 million is not is different. But you could just just as a, a fun project, I think in the, in in terms of what we spend, we spend 23, 25 thousand pounds per year, 800 odd kids, it passed that test. They liked it. They kept coming back. Uh, it was great. Uh, people commented on the assessment forms that they really thought it was a, a worthwhile thing to do. So in, in our context, in kind of housing association context, we were quite happy with it. The kind of issue that why I put it up there, because we had to do some kind of social value construction. And when we did it in a kind of boardroom level, we just went, that's nice. But we didn't do anything with it. No, there was nothing we did. It, it just happened. But really what you want to do is something that would progress. Progress the agenda. And essentially, if you were looking at that, you'd say, all our social investment, we saw, we do about £300,000 a year in social investment. If you want to maximise it, just do five-a-side football. £300,000 of five-a-side football would generate £20, £30 million. Pounds. Why not do that? So I think sometimes it leads lead you up the garden path that you have something which seems credible but actually isn't. And, and, and there's a kind of sense check to be had. And I think that's what we did in the border. We just looked at it and thought, hmm, yeah, yeah, looks all right. Looks all right on paper. But yeah, if the kids like it, we'll do more. And we do do more. Any more questions? Yes. Hello. You want me to talk to you again? Yes, <laughs> please. Um, you have the microphone. Oh, no, the mi no, microphone really. I don't. I don't need it. It's special. <laughs> um, <clears throat> social housing providers have got hacked, and, and it's a specific. Very specific. Yeah. For social housing providers, when you're talking about the corporate social responsibility in relation to third sector organisations in general. There's a lot of other different things, as Elbow's yeah. Doors, as NEP, as NBC and whatnot, yeah. which are actually far easier than hacked. So with what you've done and what you've used, you, you seem to have moved away from hacked. Uh, yes, that's correct. So why is your system better than all those other ones that's out there? Uh, I think it's because we could move back into hacked if we wanted to. Because we, we made it, we've not left that space. What we've done is we've not we've not welded it to a particular model. So if you wanted to use any of those models that you've mentioned, like that, we can incorporate it into the system. So we've made it agnostic. I think that's the kind of key key issue. It's not that we've decided to do one thing and this is it. We've made we've, we've seen there's a kind of multiplicity of approaches and that we can accommodate them. So we, we made it agnostic. So we've not we've not tied our whatever you time thing to the yeah. So does that mean, because you can always make figures prove what you want them to prove, so oh. are you choosing the thing that makes no. you look the best? No, no, I would say in that in, in whatever, every particular kind of organisational space that you work in, there's a, there's a set of metrics which have a credibility in that space. And it's almost like, um, it's like a social construction almost. That, that, um, so you in the housing team, me in the housing team, hacked as a certain 
degree of, comp of, of credibility. So you can use that kind of willy-nilly and everybody be happy. But in other spaces, you might do SROI, social return on investment, which is a really painstaking way of doing it. But what we've done is make sure that we can have a space to do that so that whatever organization wants to use our tool would use the appropriate one for their circumstances. So, but they might do some research and say, actually, this is really, this particular one is pretty good. Can we embed it into the system? And part of our kind of onboarding process would be to say, yes, just give us a values, give us a structure, we'll put it in, and you can just enter the data and we'll convert it seamlessly into something else. And in your space, it's got credibility and you'll, you'll be happy with it. Ultimately, I think what we're trying to do is, this is slightly years ahead, but when you have accountancy practices, accountancy practices are kind of fiction. Uh, where are things going, what pots, and how you, you treat things over years, etc., etc. It's, it's kind of evolved over like 400 years about how you do that. And in some respects, what we want to do is provide a space which you can have a kind of, a kind of again, a kind of socially constructed. So it's kind of social construction of the CSR space where you could say, you know, there's a kind of consistency on what I do. And if I do it this way, and you know that I do it this way, and you do it this way, you can have some faith in the outcomes that we produce at the end. And I think that's, that's the most I think we can do. We're not doing something kind of ultimately, again, back to the question right at the beginning, about measurement. But ultimately, we're not providing a, the answer. We're providing an answer which has kind of social acceptance. And social acceptance would be that people do similar things, have similar outputs, and are vaguely comparable. I think that's the best we can do in this space. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Ian. You, you can ask me a question. Hi, Doctor. Yes. Um, I know we work together, but I don't really talk to you. So uh, <laughs> where do you see the future of CSR going, uh, particularly uh, in the digital space? I, I think um, when lots of, lots of organisations have a digital presence, don't they? It's, it's, that's where they work. So I, I can't see any barriers in, in this. More and more organisations will have a digital presence. How you would see them how you would kind of in, uh, interact with them be in the digital space. So I think they need to present themselves within this arena. <coughs> and in terms of the kind of organizational macroeconomic structures, kind of legal entities that govern um, uh, organizational behavior, you can see more and more the, uh, the Companies Act for large companies large companies need to report a kind of social agenda to what they do with the economic agenda. And uh, there's the Social Value Act, so that if you're um, a public body, you would have to go through a procurement process, and they would have to show a, a kind of social dimension as part of that procurement process. So, the, and India, um, the, the new regulations are the new Two percent is it? Two percent of turnover in in or profits maybe turnover of um, in some kind of social intervention type of thing, or have a good excuse why you don't. I think that's what they actually do. But you can see the kind of movement. The movement is for organisations to move down that uh, kind of um, dynamic process into more integrated so that social values are more integrated into the economic ones and ultimately I, I, you know the, the big picture is that big business does more good than it did and hopefully it will continue uh, any more questions oh, um, i'm just thinking about impact and how you measure impact and how you divorce other external factors yeah. from measuring the impact of one project so Take, for example, your football yeah. um, uh, training sessions. When you measured the impact of what they had, how did you say if Manchester United were doing some social stuff in the area that you're working in as well, how do you divorce that from the impact measurements that you're taking? Yeah, it's, it's really tricky. And, and I, there's no two ways about it because you have, you have that issue about 
things happening whether you intervene or not. So there's kind of a dead waiting process. There's also the elements where um, other people have influence on the space that you're occupying. So um, usually what you do, you do a kind of very um, kind of pre precautionary approach. So you don't overclaim, you underclaim all the time. And anything you do claim has to kind of stand up in some way. So that if you have, um, what would you say, um, so, so say somebody else is doing some kind of um, diversionary project for young kids in your area, you'd have to acknowledge that to say they can have half of it or they can have whatever. They, they spend more time. So it's actually, it's, it goes back to the idea of having consistent rules. So, and that's what thing, that's the thing that kind of doesn't exist. They're not consistent rules, except for SROI, which is quite consistent, but it's really hard to do. But if you had a, a number of rules where everybody knew what you were doing, you could actually claim that, that value that you generate in, in the knowledge that you've discounted that somebody else might have an impact. So you're not overclaiming. So you're so you caveat your results. Everything's caveated. Yeah. So you underclaim. If anything, you underclaim rather than overclaim. If you're doing um, questionnaires, hmm. all you would have to do is put in, are you involved in any other football project? And then how do you work out what percentage of impact your interventions have? By time, I would have thought. Yeah, mainly. it could be, could be hours in, engaged. It could be could somebody else is spending a large amount of money. Or times of attendance. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know, you would probably discount it in terms of what type of kids are involved. Are the older kids, are the younger kids, and what kind of things you can claim in that respect. It's very complex. That's why we didn't do that. Yeah. But then let somebody else do that. But you could have something where if United won the triple, that that would massively increase the interest in football. Yes. And therefore, you yes. get which is completely outside your realm of interventions, yes. and that yes. would be an effect, the fact that it would affect your results. Yeah. I mean, if you look at SOI, the way that SO, SOI is done, the kind of um, the kind of precautionary element that's been embedded in that is essentially do not overclaim anything you claim. You would have to have to have good evidence for it. So they, they look at things around if, um, um, say, say the economic process, but the money spent in that area actually doesn't stay in that area, it goes into the area because people live. So you would look at the number of people, say in a workforce that's doing some kind of mm. renovation project, how many people work in that area, how much of the actual money leaves that area, what kind of multipliers. So and then, then you were kind of Limited, so you definitely wouldn't over, over So my situation is I would. Sorry, I'm really going to be really mean here and stop what's going on. Mean. It's literally gone over by like 40 minutes. And I know I'm normally a cow about stopping people, but I'm really frightened of stopping Dr. Paul Joyce. So I've let this go on for far too long. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks, Paul. Thank you. Woo!